the majority of Muslims are nonviolent. A small minority of Muslims commit terrorist attacks, like the Paris attack, San Bernardino attack, Boston bombings, Fort Hood shooting, beheadings in Oklahoma. This is Nigeria. Boko Haram Muslims come down and kill entire Christian villages and kidnap the young girls and take them out. Kenya, the mall killings. Uh, acid attack. So if a girl's not wearing a burqa in Pakistan, the young Muslim will throw acid in her face and ride off on a motor scooter. The LA Times in 2012 reported an Oscar-winning documentary, Saving Face, over 150 acid attacks on Pakistani women each year. Uh, these are churches that have been destroyed just within the last couple years. They existed for all the way back to the time of the apostles. I was in an airport and this um, Assyrian bishop with his black beard, his black robes and a big silver cross, right? And I uh, began to talk to him and he says, well, I'm from Assyria. And what's the situation? He goes, my whole diocese is wiped out. And he says, we had churches that survived the Ottomans and survived the Huns and survived everything. And now under our watch, they're being wiped out. I don't know if you just saw last week, Secretary of State Kerry declared what's going on over there, a genocide. And so when we're singing praise songs, it, it, uh, the Lord uh, just has it weigh on me because they, we have Christian brothers and sisters over there that they may be singing their last praise song before they meet the Lord. But this is going on right now. Iraq's oldest monastery was blown up uh, last month. Uh, churches being destroyed and um, the grave of Jonah. It existed from 700 BC up until last year when the ISIS Muslims destroyed the grave of Jonah. Here's the Assyrian Museum. Uh, seven to 900 BC, the Assyrian Empire was the largest empire in the world. All right, they're the one that took the 10 northern tribes of Israel captive. And anyway, so they had a museum of this and they destroyed it. So politicians assure us that these Muslim terrorists do not represent true Islam, right? So whenever there's, whenever there's a terrorist attack, the politician will get up and say, well, those, those terrorists, they don't represent true Islam. But the terrorists themselves are yelling Allahu Akbar, and they claim they are representing true Islam. Who can tell us what true Islam is? One person, Muhammad. So Muhammad was the best Muslim that ever lived. His life is called the Sunnah, which means the way or the example. And so Muhammad's life went through three stages. He was a religious leader. Then he became a political leader. Then he became a military leader. And let's go through this. So this is the world 20 years before Muhammad was born. This is the Byzantine Christian Empire. So remember the first three centuries of Christianity, there are 10 major person, persecutions and Christians are thrown to the lions. Remember that? Then Constantine converts and the Roman emperor becomes Christian and the Roman Empire becomes Christian. That was 313 AD. And so by 550 AD, the entire Roman Empire is Christian. And this is 20 years before Muhammad was born. Well, it's being attacked by Persia over here. And so in 610 AD, Muhammad's 40 years old. We see this Persian empire has conquered a whole lot of what used to be the Byzantine empire. And this is around 40 years old when Muhammad begins his faith. Now, Muhammad, his father died before he was born. His mother died when he was six years old. His grandfather and guardian died when he was eight years old. So he was orphaned and taken in by an uncle, Abu Talib, who was a merchant. And he would take Muhammad on camel rides. He would go to different cities and hear about the different religions. Pagan religions, Zoroastrian, Persian religions, the Jewish religion, the Christian religion. In 595 AD, Muhammad is 25 years old. And he marries a wealthy widow named Khadija. And she was widowed twice. She's 40 years old. And so now he does not have to work. And so he goes out to caves and prays, which is what the Christian desert fathers had done. This, I mentioned this morning this movement that swept through the church in the 4th, 5th, 6th century called pietism. And it was this idea that if you really become a Christian, you should give away your money and live in a cave. Or in Egypt, it was give away your money and build a platform in the desert and bake in the sun, thinking you're denying your flesh and getting holier. But it was all this me folk. Anyway, so Muhammad did this and he went to a cave and he prayed. And, uh, and he begins his faith in uh, 610 AD. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So in Arabia, they had 360 different pagan gods. They were mostly Canaanite fertility gods, right? Baal, Ashtaroth, associated with the sun and the moon. And the most popular god in each town was the Allah for that town. It's your basic animism, right? So that in Africa, the different 
you know, tribes would believe the different jungles are inhabited by spirits that would need to be appeased. American Indians, you know, they would say, oh, well, you know, this, this part of the woods has a spirit that needs to be appeased. In Japan, they had neighborhood gods. They'd have this little pagoda type thing on the street corner and people would put in a little slice of orange to appease the neighborhood god. I mean, this is your basic pagan animist religion. Well, in Arabia, uh, each town had its favorite god and it was the Allah for that town. Well, Mecca was a popular city. And so the Allah for the town of Mecca was Hubal, the moon god. And so these pagans had their calendar begin with the first sight of the crescent moon over the desert. And this got incorporated into Islam. And so here's the Canaanites in Book of Judges. Uh, they worshiped a moon god. And it says, Gideon slew the kings of Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the crescent half moon ornaments that were on their camels' necks. And so that half moon got incorporated into Islam. So they had this rock they thought had fallen from the moon, a glass impact rock where a meteor hit the hot desert sand, melted it into this brown glass. And so these pagans would kiss this rock, walk around this rock, bow to this rock. They did this for centuries before Muhammad was born. Muhammad kissed this rock and it got incorporated into his belief system. Now in the Middle Ages, it was destroyed in a fire. What was left, they put in this big silver rim and that's what they have today. Now that rock was in this square building called the Kaaba, but also 360 other different pagan gods were in this Kaaba. And the Persians were Zoroastrian. The Zoroastrians believed that paradise was filled full of virgins that would fulfill all the guy's desires. Muhammad heard this and it got incorporated into his belief system. The Zoroastrians also believed in genies, or jinns, spirits that followed people around. You know, I dream a genie, a thousand and one Arabian nights, and Aladdin's lamp. Matter of fact, the word genius is not somebody with a high IQ. It was somebody that had a genie that followed them around and told them all the answers. So the next time somebody says, you're a genius, you can say, no, I just have a high IQ. <laughs> now, Muhammad could not read which is not uncommon for that place, that area of the world. And even the UN Development Program reported in 2011 that 30 to 40% of people in Egypt today cannot read. So Muhammad was never able to read the Old Testament. And uh, the Jews and Christians could read. They were the exception. They were called people of the book. And so here's Muhammad. He's in this cave. And the, the, the account in the Quran and the Hadith is a spirit appeared to Muhammad and squeezed him and commanded him to read. And he said, I cannot read. Spirit squeezed him a second time, said, read. He said, I cannot read. Spirit squeezed him a third time, said, read. He said, I cannot read. Finally, the spirit threw him down and Muhammad began to recite. And that's how the Quran came to Muhammad. He'd get these verses in his mind. He'd repeat them till he had them memorized. Then he would teach them to his followers. Now, the word Quran means recitation because it's an oral thing because Muhammad and his original followers were illiterate. And you say, how can somebody that's illiterate memorize all these verses? Well, in Arabic, they had a little rhyme to them, a little beat, very similar to rap music today. So maybe there's a student that can't read in school, but he memorizes all these long rap songs. And, um, and so Muhammad... Um, goes to his wife and he tells her that he feels like he's demon possessed. And the wife decides she's gonna test the spirit. And so she takes off some of her veils and says, can you still see the spirit? And he goes, yes, over there. She takes off more veils. Can you still see the spirit? Yes, over there. And then it says that she put his head under her shift, whatever that meant. And she said, can you still see the spirit? And he goes, no. And she says, well, it must have been from, from God because it was embarrassed to look upon me without, without all my veils on. That was the test that Muhammad used to decide whether or not the spirit was from God or not, right? His wife undressing. And so how does the Bible say to test a spirit? So if you're there and you have an, a spirit or an angel appear to you and it's really goose bumpy and it's really, you know, uh, awesome. And then you ask the spirit a question. Um, it says in 1 John that every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus has come in the flesh and he's the Christ, the son of God is of the devil. Uh, so are you going to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, come in the flesh, right? So Muhammad didn't use the Bible test on the spirit. He, he used a different one. So his wife uh, takes Muhammad to her cousin, who was an Ebionite Christian priest of a heretical sect. And he says, maybe this is the spirit that appeared to Muhammad and he dies a week later. So now here's Muhammad with this spirit and uh, so forth. So Muhammad could not read the Old Testament, but he heard their oral stories called Talmud and Mishnah. And some of those stories got incorporated into his belief system. And then there's the Christian faith. And even Encyclopedia Britannica stated of Muhammad, the gospel was known to him chiefly through apocryphal and heretical sources. So Muhammad thought the Trinity was the father, Mary and Jesus. Nobody explained to him the Holy Spirit. There are Muslims today that think Christians are polytheists worshiping three gods, the Father, Mary, and Jesus. And 
Now, what are apocryphal? Those are books that are not inspired, so they're not in our Bible. One apocryphal work was the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. It was written several centuries after Christ by someone who knew nothing of Jewish life, fanciful little what if stories when Jesus was a little boy. Uh, this would be like you making up stories of Abraham Lincoln, uh, but you have him living in China. It's like nobody's going to take your book serious. And so this infancy gospel is, co- is filled with full of so many errors and inconsistencies that no Bible scholar acknowledges uh, that there's any truth to it. It's just fanciful little what if stories. Well, Muhammad heard these stories and they got incorporated into his belief system. So the infancy gospel said Jesus spoke from the cradle, made clay birds and clapped, and they flew away and raised the planet from the dead. Guess what stories Muhammad heard? Now they're in the Quran. Jesus spoke from the cradle, made clay birds, and clap, flew away, and raised a playmate from the dead. There's no other place in ancient literature that these stories appear other than this infancy gospel that no one then or now takes serious. And um, anyway, then the heretical works. What were the heresies? Well, first one was Arianism, said Jesus is mostly man. And then there's uh, Docetism that said he was completely God. And then there was you know, monophysism, and then there was the Ebionism that said he was completely man, all these different heresies that had to do with the deity of Christ. And so Muhammad starts his faith in 610 AD, and he's very excited about it. He feels like there's something in it for everyone. And he goes into the city of Mecca, and he only makes 70 converts in 12 years. And he gets frustrated that not very many are joining him, and he begins to get confrontational. And he hangs around that square building called the Kaaba, and he begins to insult the pagans and tell them that they're going to burn in hell. Well, the pagans are like, look, we're really tolerant. We're letting you start your new faith here, but now you're getting too exclusive. And so when Muhammad's rich uncle, Abu Talib, the merchant, dies in 619 AD, the people of Mecca decide, let's chase Muhammad out. And they finally do in 622 AD. He tries going to a city called Al-Taif. They don't want him. They pelt him with rocks and stones. And so Muhammad has no place to go. He is a Muslim refugee. And so Muhammad goes north 210 miles to a Jewish city called Medina. The Jews are nice. They let Muhammad in as a Muslim immigrant. And he goes into the minority neighborhoods in Medina, and he begins to organize a following. All right, we're familiar with the term of organizing in the community. And so he goes amongst the pagans, and they have no voice in this Jewish-controlled government of the city. And so uh, they have grievances, and they feel like they've been victimized, and so he organizes them. And then he goes to the Jewish leaders, and he pressures them to accommodate him and his followers politically. And the Jews make a treaty with Muhammad. Now he is a religious leader and a political leader. Then Muhammad's followers in Mecca, they get pushy, argumentative, confrontational, and threatening. They're chased out of town for disturbing the peace. They go to Medina, uh, because they're Muslim refugees now. They go to Medina, and they let him in as Muslim immigrants. And Muhammad allows his followers to rob the caravans headed to Mecca in retaliation for the Meccans chasing him out of town. So where Jesus said, if they take your coat, give them your shirt, Muhammad's attitude was, if they take your house, you retaliate, take their caravan. So he gets a whole chapter of the Quran on how to distribute booty from robbing caravans. Uh, It's Surah 8, chapter 8. He got a fifth of the booty. And so the Meccans decide to send a thousand soldiers uh, to protect their caravan and escort it as it went by Medina. And Muhammad, with 300 warriors, defeats 1,000 at the Battle of Badra in 624 AD. This amazing victory, having been outnumbered three to one, convinces Muhammad to be a military leader. And he fights in 66 battles and raids in the next eight years before he dies. He even used the catapult when he attacked a city called Al-Taif. And when they told Muhammad this catapult was hurling these rocks that were killing innocent women and children, Muhammad's response was, they are among them. They got to be killed too. So suicide bombers and ISIS killers today say it's okay to kill innocent people to advance Islam because Muhammad did. And since he is the perfect Muslim and his life is the sunnah, the way, the example, there are Muslims that want to follow his example religiously, politically, and militarily. So there's freedom for all religions in America. But Islam is not just a religion because Muhammad was not just a religious leader. He was a political and a military leader. So a mosque is a religious building, a political building, and a military building. Bowing to Mecca is a religious bowing, a political bowing, and a military pledging of allegiance to another capital. And our effort in the West to split the religious side of Islam away from the political military side is is we're trying to split Muhammad. Who are we to split their prophet? He was all three, a religious leader, a political leader, and a military leader. And so there's two sets of verses in the Quran based on the two cities Muhammad lived in. In Mecca, he was just a religious leader. And so those verses are relatively more peaceful. In Medina, he becomes a political military leader, and those verses are more violent. 
and the later verses supersede the earlier verses. By way of comparison in the Bible, we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. Old Testament has some violence in it, Moses and Joshua wiping out tribes. New Testament, Jesus and the apostles never killed anyone. And so what do we say? The later, more peaceful example is the one we're gonna strive to imitate, right? It's the same way in Islam, only in reverse. Their peaceful verses came first when Muhammad was a religious leader in Mecca, and they're superseded by the verses in Medina that are more violent and political military. So the last example Muhammad left was the political militant example. And so in 627 AD, the Meccans are hurting. And it turns out Muhammad is a brilliant military leader, primarily because he's creative, he's unconventional, unpredictable. Uh, he, he does not play by the rules of traditional Arab warfare. So there's one month off a year where these Arabs agreed not to fight. It was their pilgrimage month and they would go to that square building and worship their different pagan gods. Muhammad gets verses from his Allah instructing him to attack the caravans during this month. Catches them totally off guard, comes away with a lot of booty. And so the Meccans decide to send 10,000 soldiers to Medina to stop Muhammad and his men from robbing caravans. And Muhammad's version of roadside bombs and IEDs was he dug potholes and trenches all around the city, which rendered the superior cavalry of the Meccans useless. You can't charge your horses and camels across a field full of potholes and trenches while you're being shot at, they'll break their legs. So it throws off the battle strategy. And so Muhammad goes to some of the tribes at night and he bribes them and they slip away. He goes to some of the other pagans at night and he threatens them and they slip away. So sort of the, you know, the, the bribe or the bullet, the silver or the lead, you know, and then it gets freezing cold for a week and the rest of the Meccans lose heart and decide to retreat and bring their troops home. And it leaves a power vacuum, very similar to two years ago when our president declared war in Iraq and Afghanistan was over, mission complete, brings all of our troops home and leaves a power vacuum. Did they get more peaceful? No, just last week, our secretary of state said they declared a, a genocide. So when Muhammad saw these Meccans retreating, he was emboldened and he goes back into the city of Medina. And remember those three Jewish tribes that let him in five years earlier? One of them does something that offends Muhammad and he whips his followers into a jihad frenzy and they attack that Jewish neighborhood, confiscate their property, chases them out of town. Then the second Jewish tribe does something that offends Muhammad and his followers. He whips them into a frenzy. They attack that second Jewish tribe, confiscate their property, chase them out of town. This set a precedent in Islam called hudna, H-U-D-N-A, hudna. It means when you're weak, you make treaties until you get strong enough to disregard them. And so it's a temporary thing. So here we are wanting the Jews to make a treaty with the Palestinians when the Palestinian concept of a treaty is just a ceasefire to restock missiles. Here we are doing a treaty with Iran when the Iranian concept of a treaty is just you put your enemy off so you can finish your nuclear missile program. And so the um, third Jewish tribe in Medina, Muhammad bottles them in their neighborhood for 25 days. When they finally surrender, he brings them into the market and he chops off their heads. Six or 700 of them get their heads chopped off. And then he sells the women and children into slavery. He did keep one of the wives for himself, Rehana. He ended up having 11 to 22 wives, slave wives, concubines. Youngest was Aisha, the six-year-old. But within five years of Muhammad immigrating into the Jewish city of Medina, there is not a Jew left in the city of Medina. They were chased out, killed, or enslaved. And within five years of Muhammad's death, every pre-existing culture in Arabia was wiped out. And so we see it's a three-step process. Like Caesar's three steps, vini, vidi, vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. Muhammad's three steps was immigrate, increase, eliminate. Immigrate into the host country as a religious refugee. Then increase the number of your followers of those who feel like they've been victimized and have grievances and then demand political accommodation. And then eliminate the previous culture, neighborhood by neighborhood, city by city until you take over. So I was speaking in Detroit, Michigan and visiting with people afterwards and a story of a lady who had a ministry to pregnant moms. She shows up at the Muslim house with a little present. While she's there, out of a bedroom comes another pregnant Muslim mom. Out of a bedroom comes another pregnant Muslim mom. Out of a bedroom comes another pregnant Muslim mom, all pregnant by the same man. He's practicing Sharia law polygamy in his house in Dearborn, Michigan. Somebody else comes by, by my book table, says, oh, Fazl bought a bunch of houses on the block, has a wife in each one. They go down to the welfare office and say the husband's not around and they get these checks. 
He visits the wives, and the more children they have, the larger the checks get. He's living like a king at state expense, and all the kids playing in the middle of the street are his kids. He's practicing Sharia law polygamy on his block in Dearborn, Michigan. They take over several more blocks, and they vote in the school board. And so now they have the, all the girls wearing the burqas, and they have their prayers in the school, right? So the boys are in the front, because the, Islam says if a dog, a donkey, or a woman is between you and Mecca when you're praying, your prayers are invalidated. And so the, the boys are at the front, and then behind them are the girls, and then behind them are the girls having their monthly uh, period because they're considered unclean. So it's this strategy of, of, of how they segregate their peoples. And um, anyway, so we see in, uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, they now are doing this in the schools. And where's the ACLU? Well, they're not around. And then in Dearborn, they take over several more blocks and they vote in the police department, the fire department. And they have, like in Hamtramck, Michigan, they voted in a majority Muslim city council. And now they have their minarets and their calls to prayer on loudspeakers five times a day. And all the Polish previous inhabitants are being driven out. There was an article just about a month ago that this little Polish lady says, you can't hear because when they blow those, those, their Muslim prayers, it's so loud, you know. So it's this three-step process. Now, there's always that one stickler that says, I'm not going to move out. I grew up in this neighborhood. And that's when Muslim youth do random violence and there's no witnesses because no Muslim family is going to testify against another Muslim family on behalf of a Kafir infidel. And so they eventually take over the neighborhood. And so there's a 1400 year track record to demonstrate what I just explained. So if I was pitching the stock investment tonight, I'd say this is the greatest stock in the world. You would listen and then go home and check out the track record. Is it going up or down? If I'm gonna pitch a religion and say, oh, it's real peaceful. You say, oh, okay, let me check out the track record. We just happen to have 1400 years of track record. So it's pretty predictable. And it's broken down into three springs, the Arab Persian Spring from 622 to 1071, a Turkish Spring from 1071 to 1923, and a third Arab Spring started in 1928. We're gonna go through these real quick. Now, one of the ways that Islam spread is through what's called psychological projection or blame shifting, where the attacker blames the victim, right? Everybody that grows up in the schoolyard, there's a bully that pushes everybody around, and some kid had enough and swings back, and, the, and then the, the, the bully jumps on him and pummels him, and, and he says, well, teacher, he started it. He hit me first, right? But everybody knows that the, he was bullied. Wife beaters do this, right? Because this little diminutive wife, and the husband says, you provoked me, and he beats the tar out of her, right? And so in Islam, it's this idea that the, they come in, and they accuse you of being intolerant, when really they're the ones that are intolerant. And um, so they would come up to a city and offer them peace and say, well, if you want peace, embrace Islam. And if you don't embrace Islam, they say, well, you, you know, you, you had your chance and then they attack him. It would not have spread without this little invention called a stirrup, invented by Mongolian nomads over by China. Mongolia had these little short horses with, and they tie ropes around them because they would ride barefoot and they help them keep balance when they ride. And they stick their big toes in the little loop. You know, they would raid into China. The Chinese made the loops big enough for your whole foot. That made its way across the Gobi Desert, the China Silk Road to Persia. And the Persians made them real big with metal and leather straps. This gave you complete control in the saddle. And then they got these curved swords made of Damascus steel. They're called scimitars. And they're as light as a razor blade. So you could hold the reins of the horse in one hand, the scimitar sword in the other, and at a full gallop, they literally could slice someone in half. And this was the fastest thing on the battlefield. And so here's the U.S. Supreme Court chamber in Washington, D.C. has a marble frieze carvings around the ceiling on the inside, and it has lawgivers throughout history. It does have Moses and his 10 Hebrew commandments and Charlemagne and John Marshall, but it has Mohammed with his Arabic Quran and his scimitar sword. And this is Mohammed's sword. Still exists in Istanbul, Turkey in a palace museum. And so we see this lightning expansion. Mohammed's general, Khalid ibn al-Walid, was called the drawn sword of Allah because he was undefeated in over 100 battles. He would attack the apostate um, Muslims that wanted to, to leave Islam and the Persian armies and the Byzantine armies. And, um, and the Muslims conquered Syria. Did you know Syria was the first country that was completely Christian, evangelized by the apostle Paul? The name Christian was first used in Syria. 
There's more ancient Christian writing in the Syrian language of Syriac than any other language other than Greek and Latin. And these Syrian Christians evangelized east like the Greeks did west. So these Syrian Christians evangelized into India, Mongolia, even China during the Tang Dynasty in the 600s had a thriving Syrian Christian community. But it was largely wiped out by a Muslim leader named Tamerlane. He killed 17 million people, left pyramids of skulls, and wiped out Christianity in Central Asia. But Syria used to be Christian until Caliph Umar conquered it. And then Muslims conquered Yemen, which used to be a Jewish kingdom. Egypt used to be Christian, evangelized by Mark that wrote the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, until Amir ibn al conquers it. Then they conquered it into Persia and into Armenia. There used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa in the 7th century. They were all conquered by the Umayyad Muslims, all within 23 years of Muhammad's death. And they dominated the Mediterranean, cut off all trade, and then they invaded Spain, and they had Corsica, Sicily, Sardinia, all these islands. And it... Uh, destroyed the economy of Rome because they traded across the Mediterranean. Again, this would be like if China held their ships back for a couple months, all of our Walmart shelves would be empty. And so Rome had an economic um, uh, heart attack. And when the Muslims conquered Egypt, they destroyed the library at Alexandria. It was the oldest library in the world. Went back to stuff with Abraham's day and Caliph Umar conquers it. And the warriors ask him what to do with the books. And he said, every book that does not agree with the Quran, destroy. And every book that does agree with the Quran is redundant because we have the Quran, so destroy them all. It supposedly took six months to burn them all. Anyway, the papyrus were reeds that grew along the Nile Delta. They dried out, sent to Europe, and they used them for paper. So suddenly there was a paper shortage in Europe, and they wrote fewer books, and we call this the beginning of the Dark Ages. So Islam is largely responsible for Europe entering the Dark Ages. And so in the year 711, they invade Spain. Spaniards are still fighting on foot with heavy metal swords. Muslims are on these Arabian horses with stirrups and scimitar swords. In 10 years, they conquer all of Spain. And then they conquer southern France. There's a city there called Bordeaux. In one pass, the Muslim cavalry annihilated the Frankish army. The Franks are all on foot with these heavy metal swords. The Muslim cavalry is charging. The ground is rumbling. They got their scimitar swords out. In one pass, they're all dead. They turn around for a second, go at them. They're unstoppable, setting up their ISIS, their Islamic state, their caliphate. And so Pope Gregory puts out a plea that anybody that could fight should join Charles Martel. He was the grandfather of Charlemagne. Charles Martel gets 30,000 volunteers right around Tours, France, just outside of Paris. And he puts them on top of a hill in a square. 30,000 guys on foot packed together in a square. So when the Muslims are charging uphill, all they can see is the front couple lines. They think, oh, we'll just charge through like we did before. They charge in and get stuck. Meanwhile, Charles, Charles Martel had arranged for some of his men to sneak into the Muslim camp and free the captives. They fought for religion, but they also fought for plunder. Muhammad said you can have four wives plus as many extra women as your right hand possesses. It means as many as you take in battle. They just don't have the status of a wife. So they're slave wives and concubines and so forth. Of course, the Sultan got a fifth of the booty because that was Muhammad's portion. Many Sultans had a thousand wives. Well, as the warriors the Muslim warriors saw their women being let go from the camp. They would leave the fighting to reclaim. And um, the Muslim commander sees them and tries to rally his soldiers back. And he gets distracted and he gets killed. And now the Muslim warriors cannot decide who's, who their next commander is going to be. They begin to bicker and fight. They pick up and they go back to Spain. That was the Battle of Tours in 732 AD, exactly 100 years after the death of Muhammad in 632 AD. They went from Arabia to Paris in a military campaign. Had Charles Martel not stopped them, there was no other army in Europe. They would be unopposed all the way to Poland. And we would be speaking Arabic right now because German, French, English, and Spanish would have never developed as languages. We'd be like Egypt where the Muslims actually cut out the tongues of anybody caught speaking the Coptic language. Coptic is the Egyptian word for Egyptian. So they brought in the Arab, Arabic, Arabic language and implanted it into Egypt. So Charles Martel gets every horse he can find, learns how to make a stirrup, Five years later, wins his first battle, and it takes 700 years of battles to drive the Muslims out of Spain. All these courageous battles at Saragossa and Toledo and Cordova. And now, some definitions. The word Islam means submission to the will of Allah. A Muslim is one who has submitted to the will of Allah. And Islam believes there will be world peace when the whole world submits to the will of Allah. So Islam is a religion of peace. It's just their definition of the word peace is different than our definition. Our definition of peace is different groups getting along. Their definition of world peace is world Islam. So when they say it's a religion of peace, yeah, that's their goal is to make everyone submit to Allah, everyone be Islam, right? 
Abraham Lincoln said, we all declare for liberty, but in using the same word, we do not all mean the same thing. We all want peace, but when we say it, it's not the same as when they say it. So in Islam, the world's divided in two, the half that has submitted to Allah and the half that's in the process of submitting to Allah. So they see the world as Muslim and going to be Muslim. The half that submitted is the house of Islam. The half that's in the process, the Dar al-Harb, is the house of war. The non-Muslim world is supposed to be at war because it's in the process of submitting. What about moderate Muslims? Moderate Muslims believe the world will submit to Allah later. Maybe at the end of the world, maybe in the distant future, maybe it's even figurative. And since it's so far off, they really don't think about it that often. They just want to live their lives, have their family, fine. That type of Muslim has no problem living in a free democratic society and having you as a kafir infidel, as a neighbor. The fundamental Muslim, though, they think the world is supposed to submit to Allah now. And they're really excited and they want to help make it happen. Now, the dilemma we face in the West is the more we show ourselves nice and tolerant and respectful and accommodating and really careful not to offend them, the moderate Muslim begins to rethink and says, you know, this has never happened before, that the biggest infidel country is letting us come in as immigrants and paying us $2,500 a month and giving us free Section 8 housing and free food, free clothes, free education, free everything. This is, and, and now they're really careful not to offend. This has never happened. Maybe the world is, in fact, submitting to Allah now rather than later. And so they gravitate from the future peaceful moderate camp into the fundamental now camp, which is the violent camp. So in Islam, they have a concept. When your enemy shows weakness, that is Allah giving them to you. So my daughter had a friend who led school field trips to the zoo, and they would go in front of the wolf cage and would have a kid walk in front of the wolf cage, real bold and strong. The wolves didn't even bother looking at him. Had the same kid walk in front of the cage acting like he's injured. And all of a sudden, the wolves look at him. And then they're starting to... <laughs> And then they were trying to walk back and forth, figure out how they can get across the ditch to get him. And weakness invites aggression, right? So if a lion's chasing a zebra and the zebra trips, does the lion slow down or does it pounce? Uh, our foreign policy has been like a football game where the other team's playing tough. So we get in the huddle. We tell ourselves, tell you what, let's let them get a first down. They'll get it out of their system. And then they'll let us get a first down. That doesn't work. So we get in the huddle. We say, tell you what, let's let them score. Then certainly they'll be nice and let us score. That doesn't work. We keep giving them touchdown after touchdown. We can't understand the more yardage we give up. Instead of them giving us a turn, they're getting more excited and they're packing out the stadium and they're on their feet cheering, right? So um, another word to define is innocent, right? So when Muslims kill people in Paris, our president gave a speech and says, well, those killers do not represent true Islam because Islam says it's wrong to kill the innocent. Well, innocent is a follower of the way of Allah. So if you are not a follower of the way of Allah, if you reject Allah, you're guilty. And it says, Allah loveth not those who reject the faith. Be ruthless to the infidel, means unbeliever. Make war on the infidel. Fight those who believe not in Allah. Kill the disbeliever wherever we find them. So when they say it's wrong to kill the innocent, it's code for it's wrong to kill faithful Muslims. Now, in all due respect, the ones that are doing the killing, they view the non-violent Muslims as having left the way of Allah, and they're just as happy to kill a non-violent Muslim as they are to kill an infidel. Spain, it took 700 years to drive the Muslims out of Spain. And here's Charlton Heston playing uh, El Cid, Rodrigo Diaz. I met Charlton Heston, he, he endorsed me when I ran for Congress years ago, he was the head of the NRA. And so El Cid is charging. And they're fighting the Muslims out of this area of Spain, but they need one more charge to win, but he's wounded. And they're looking at him and say, you're bleeding to death. You're not going to survive. And he's like, well, I'm going to die anyway. Put me back on the horse. Tie me on really tight with a board up my back. They open the barn doors and they slap the horse and he goes off riding. And his men go, there goes all sit. They hurry up, jump on their horses and they go off riding. And they win the battle. After the victory, they're celebrating. They go, where's El Cid? They see him over there all by himself, you know, sort of drooped over. It's one of those romantic chick flicks, you know? Should we watch The Notebook or El Cid? <laughs> um, anyway, so they're driving the Muslims out, courageous battles. While they were in Spain, they enslaved over a million people. And uh, there were whole Catholic orders in Europe through the Middle Ages called the Trinitarians. And the head of the order was called the Ransomer. And they would collect alms and donations and go to North Africa to ransom your friend back who was captured from a Greek island or an Italian coast. And... Um, in 846 AD, 11,000 Muslims invaded Rome, Italy, and they trashed the Basilica of St. Peter's, and they trashed the graves of St. Peter and St. Paul, right? So the 
St. Peter was crucified upside down to the Circus Maximus. And then after they became Christian, they built a big church there called the Basilica of St. Peter's. And, and then as the centuries went on, the thing was tipping over like four feet from top to bottom. But um, it was called the Basilica. And so this is when the Muslims attacked and they trashed it. After the attack is when Pope Leo decided to build the wall around the Vatican because it was actually outside of the city of Rome. And so you have the Pope building a wall to keep the Muslim invaders out. And, um, and so then they had pirates at sea and they raided the coast of Italy. There were a whole coast of Italy where there was not a woman of childbearing age for generations because they would come up sort of like Boko Haram, round up the women, take them to North Africa, sell them into slavery. And they invaded England. And in 1625, Muslim pirates carried, carried away over a thousand from England. In 1630, they attacked Ireland, the stolen village of Baltimore, Ireland. Uh, Muslims came up and attacked and carried them away to Morocco. And then they attacked in Reykjavik, Iceland, carried away thousands. And then they enslaved an estimated 180 million Africans. They would castrate the men, make them eunuchs, sell the women into the sex trafficking. They had slavery in Africa for eight centuries before America was ever discovered. Muhammad was a white Arab. There are hadiths that talk about when he pray and lift his arms, they would see the whiteness of his armpits. Another hadith story that there were, a guy was going on his donkey to early morning prayer, rubs up against the prophet's donkey, and he says, I saw the whiteness of the prophet's thigh. Another hadith, some visitors wanted to meet Muhammad, and they said he is the white man reclining on the couch. And Muhammad owned African slaves. So in Arabic, they have one word for African and slave. It's the same word, abd, A-B-D. Like abdullah means slave of Allah, so abd means slave. So every black person, they call him slave. And so uh, they would attack these villages and kill about a third in the conquest. And then the elderly and young would not survive the forced marches to the uh, Timbuktu and the Muslim slave markets. And it went on for eight centuries before America was discovered. And uh, then finally, Columbus discovers the new world and the Spaniards come over and there's two different kinds, right? You always have people motivated by greed and people motivated by the gospel. Right? So you always have the ones digging wells and having filtered water and, and uh, having orphanages and medical clinics. Right? And you always have the ones that are taking land from the Indians, selling people into slavery and voting for candidates they think will help their pocketbook, even though the candidate stands for immorality. Right? So we still have these two threads today. And so you had uh, the greedy ones had these plantations and they enslaved Native Americans for about 50 years. And the same time Martin Luther's doing the Reformation, in America there's a Catholic priest named Bartolome de las Casas he spends his whole life to convince the king of Spain to stop the enslavement of Native Americans. And he's finally successful, and they're all celebrating. And then someone says, well, where can we get more slaves? And someone said, Africa. That's when they began to go to the Muslim slave markets and buy Africans to bring over to America. So virtually every African brought to America was purchased at a Muslim slave market. And uh, it went on through the 1800s. Here's David Livingston, the Scottish missionary to the Congo, writes in his journal about stumbling on a path of Africans shackled together, being marched single file through the jungle to be sold into Muslim slavery. And if they walk too slow, they just stab them or shoot them. He writes in his journal about stumbling across this lady bleeding to death. And what happened? Oh, she was walking too slow. And so they shot her. He says, you could tell where the trails were by looking for the vultures circling. He goes through a valley and he's witnessing to the different tribes, comes back a year later, ghost villages. Because the Muslim Arab slave traders rounded them all up, took them away. Somebody gave David Livingston a paddle boat, you know, with a little steam engine to go up the rivers. He said, get breaking because it would hit the dead bodies of the Africans. He writes in his journal, if there's anything in my life and ministry that can stop this monster that hangs over Africa of the Muslim Arab slave trade, my life will be worth it. And it still goes on today. There's actually more slavery today than at any other time in world history, and a whole lot of it is in Muslim countries, Niger, Mauritania, Sudan, and it's, they call it forced marriages and sex trafficking and so forth. Anyway, so we just talked about Muslims coming across North Africa into Spain, but then they had the audacity to attack, attack Constantinople. Constantinople was the capital of Europe. Anyway, they were turned back because the defenders had something called Greek fire. And this is where they took oil and sawdust, sprayed it out of these hot oil cannons like napalm. So like holding a match in front of a can of hairspray. You never tried that, right? Don't try that at home. Um, so they sprayed this hot oil and the Muslims were stopped. Well, all that was the first Arab Spring. And the people say, well, Bill, you just talked about Muslims killing people. Didn't Christians kill people too? What about the Crusades, huh? Let's talk about that. That's the second spring, the Turkish spring. And uh, before we get into that, 
there's one way of saying, well, you know, Muslims kill people, Christians kill people. Every religion has crazies that kill people. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, let's not compare the followers, let's compare the founders, right? So if your computer acts up, what do you do? You reload the software the way it was when you bought it. If it really acts up, you reformat the disk the way it was when you bought it. Well, if your religion acts up, what do you do? You go back to the way it was when it left the founder. So let's compare the founders of the two largest religions in the world. Christianity is the largest religion in the world, around 32, 33%. Islam is the second largest religion in the world, around 22, 23%. 16% unaffiliated, 15% Hindu, 7% Buddhist, down to 0.2% Jewish. So let's compare the founders of the two largest religions in the world. Jesus never killed anybody. Muhammad killed an estimated 3,000 people, including cutting off the heads of those 700 Jews. Jesus never led armies. Muhammad led armies. He fought in 66 battles and raids. Jesus never owned slaves. Muhammad got a fifth of the slaves taken in battle. Jesus never married. Muhammad had anywhere from 11 to 22 wives, slave wives, concubines, the youngest being six-year-old Aisha. He had a dream two nights in a row of him marrying the daughter of this general Abu Bakr. And the general said, well, you're the prophet. Here she is. Jesus never tortured anyone. When Muhammad conquered Kaibar, the last Jewish settlement in Arabia, the chief refused to tell where the tribe's treasure was hidden, so Muhammad had him stretched out on the ground. They kindled a fire on his chest, and he still didn't t tell, so Muhammad beheaded him. Jesus didn't lie. Remember, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Muhammad permitted lying. It's called taqiyya, sacred lying, holy deceit. You're obligated to lie to the infidel until you can get the advantage and behead them. And so there's a story of... Um, a chieftain was planning on attacking Muhammad and he goes to his warriors and he said, who will rid me of the chieftain? His one warrior said, I will if you permit me to lie. And so the warrior goes to the chieftain and he says, I've left Muhammad. He's a heretic. I want to help you, but they're after me. And the chieftain says, okay, you can spend the night in my tent. You'll have my whole army surrounding you. You'll be safe. So in the middle of the night, the warrior tiptoes over and beheads the chieftain, takes his head, runs all the way to Muhammad and says, oh, prophet, Allah's face is shown upon you. And Muhammad says, no, Allah's face is shown upon you. And Muhammad gives him his staff, says you can lean on this in the day of judgment. So Muhammad approved of lying until you can take advantage. Another story is there was a Muslim warrior who was captured and he was forced to renounce Muhammad and he escaped, came back to Muhammad. Muhammad forgave him. And he said, if they make you turn, turn, but don't turn in your heart. In other words, it's okay to deny Muhammad in a pinch to save your skin as long as you don't fight against Islam. In other words, it's okay to say you're not a Muslim in order to get elected, but then everything you do once you're elected is to help advance Islam. Anyway, um, Jesus never forced anyone to follow him. Remember, he multiplied loaves and fishes and had a group of people following him for the wrong reasons. And so he says something really difficult to understand. He says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And many disciples said, this is a difficult saying, who can bear it? And they walked with him no more. He turns to Peter, says, you want to go too? Peter says, well, I don't understand what you said, but you're the only one with the words of eternal life. So I'm with you. Muhammad said, whoever changes his Islamic religion, kill him. So here's Jesus saying, Jesus almost intentionally saying stuff to get, get people to not follow him, you know, who are following him for the wrong reasons. He's sort of intentionally shaking him away. Muhammad said, whoever changes his Islamic religion, kill him. So you're free to join, you just can't leave. Sort of like Hotel California. And um, matter of fact, this is a Muslim leader currently in Egypt. And he says, if they had gotten rid of the apostasy punishment, that means killing people who leave Islam, Islam would not exist today. Islam would have ended since the death of the prophet. And so I was visiting with a Muslim who became a Christian. His name is uh, Elijah uh, Abraham. Of course, that's a changed name because he didn't want all his Muslim relatives to be killed when they find out his real name. But anyway, he started a ministry, livingoasis.org. He said, if they removed the apostasy punishments, 90% of Muslims would leave overnight. What is that? If you are a Muslim and you leave, your own family will come after you. You could be free for a couple years and then some distant cousin can show up at the door and kill you. I mean, it's like your entire life, you're always sort of looking over your shoulder. And um, Jesus never avenged insults. Muhammad said, uh, there was a guy named Ibn Qatal made up poems making fun of him. So Muhammad ordered him murdered. Jesus did not permit his disciples to rape anyone. Duh, Muhammad did. There's always hadith on how to do it. None of the apostles were governors or generals. Every one of the caliphs was a governor and a general. Jesus taught God was our father. In Islam, it's blasphemy to call Allah your father. Jesus taught we're children of God. In Islam, it's blasphemy to call yourself a child of Allah because Allah took no wife and has no son. Jesus taught we're made in the image of God. In Islam, Allah has no image. And Jesus taught to have a personal relationship with God. 
And uh, in Islam, it's blasphemy to even want to have a personal relationship with Allah. And the first three centuries of Christianity, there are 10 major persecutions. Christians are thrown to the lions and they never led an armed resistance. The first three centuries of Islam, they conquered from Arabia to Paris. I wanted to say one thing about this forced following. Um, the God of the Bible is a God of love. And the more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. Now, God does not need our love, but he wants it. So like parents don't have to have kids, but they sort of want to have kids and they pour all the love into the kids. And what makes them happy is that the kids just says, thank you, right? And, and shows the love back, even though the kid can never repay everything. And so the idea is that for our response to be a love response, it must be voluntary. It has to be an act of your free will and your conscience. And he's, God's not interested in forcing us to submit or he chops our head off. He's interested in this mystical thing of you voluntarily loving him. And so, not so in Islam. They don't really care if you have a warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart. They want outward compliance. Does that make sense? It's an important difference. So there's 14 centuries of Muslim crusades and they kill an estimated 240 million people. There's only two centuries of European crusades, maybe a million died. So all these red dots are all the battles of Muslim crusades and that's the very few that um, the Europeans did. And so the Muslims are closing in on the Byzantine Empire. Uh, matter of fact, the most popular Greek saint was St. Nicholas, lived during Roman times, gave to the poor. And when the Muslims would come into an area, they would destroy the graves of the Christian saints. You know how they got the, the bones of St. Mark out of Egypt? The Christians packed them under pork to ship them to Venice, Italy. And, and the grave of Jonah was recently destroyed. Well, the, the St. Nicholas, the most popular Greek saint, he lived during Roman times, gave to the poor, and uh, the Greeks would leave presents for each other on the anniversary of his death. Just a Greek thing until the Muslims invaded and uh, they were going to trash his grave, so they moved his remains over to Italy. And uh, the Pope, Urban II, is the one who dedicates the church. And it was the same Pope, Urban II, that goes to the Council of Claremont and he begs these European leaders to send help. He says, Jesus said, leave the 99 and go after the one. And so these European uh, kings send help. It's called the what? The Crusades, right? So that's what the Crusades were. Now, a little bit about the St. Nicholas story. Um, you know how Catholics will say St. Peter's at the gates of heaven? Well, the Greeks did a take on the verse in the Bible where Jesus will return at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead, riding a white horse. And the saints will come back with him riding a white horse. And St. Nicholas is one of the saints. So certainly he'll be one of those riding a white horse. The Greeks just had him coming back once a year for a little mini judgment, a little checkup on the kids, making sure they're on the right track. And in Norway, they didn't have horses, so he's riding a reindeer. And the saints come from where? Heaven, the celestial city, the new Jerusalem, that turns into the North Pole. And the Lamb's Book of Life and Book of Works turns into the Book of the Naughty and the Nice, and the angels turn into the elves. And before you know it, you're pretty off track. Anyway, so um, <laughs> in Holland, they still have... Uh, so that's where his grave was, and they moved his bones over to Bari, Italy. So in Holland, they still have St. Nicholas coming once a year. And he's dressed as a bishop riding a white horse. And he has with him a little Moorish costumed helper. The Moors were the Muslims. And they tell, told the kids in Holland that if you're good, St. Nicholas gives you a present. If you're naughty, his little helper, Zvarte Pete, will put you in a gunny sack, take you back to Spain, and sell you into Muslim slavery. And so here's these Dutch cartoons. There's Bishop Nicholas, St. Nicholas. They're like shoving the little kid. The parents are like, well, son, it's nice knowing you, kid, you know. And the little girl's like, oh, my, don't take me. And uh, here's another one. They're putting them a little, please don't take my little brother. And they're like, oh, my. I, had, I have 11 brothers and sisters. And so I would have loved to have tormented my little brothers with this. You know, you might not be here tomorrow. I was actually doing a radio interview and a guy calls in and he goes, yeah, I was raised in Holland and every Christmas Eve, all the little boys would make sure to go to sleep at night with a pocket knife in their pocket. I said, why is that? He goes, that's to cut ourselves out of the gunny sack in case Varte Pete took us. But this was this fear that was over the Europeans was that the Muslim pirates would come up and take you. And so Pope Urban II, calls for help to go to Alexis Comnenus, who was the Byzantine emperor. They send help, it's called the First Crusade. There's nine major crusades in 200 years. And uh, Richard the Lionheart led the Third Crusade, left his brother King John in charge of England. We know King John because of the Sherwood Forest, the Nottingham and the Robin Hood stories, right? And, um, and then St. Louis led the Seventh and Eighth Crusades. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri is where I was born. And um, he was the king of France, King Louis IX, and he led the 7th and 8th Crusades. The Crusades ended, but in a sense, they saved Europe. How did the Crusades save Europe? Well, the Muslims would attack by divide and conquer. So if Mohammed would have come into Medina and said, in five years, there's not going to be a Jew left, they would have banded together. 
But instead, he picks on the smallest of the Jewish tribes, and the other two are like, eh, we never liked that tribe. Then he picks on the next smaller one, and the other big one's like, well, they were always a thorn in my side. Now there's only one tribe, and he's able to surround and conquer it. And so the Muslims conquered Egypt because the Byzantine Christians were persecuting the Coptic Christians. The Muslims said, well, we'll help you drive off the Byzantines. Well, they did, and they stayed, and they took over. They took over Spain because there were warring Christian Visigothic kingdoms, and one of them got the bright idea to have the Muslims on their side, came across, conquered all. And so when you had the Byzantine and the Catholics, the, they, the controversy there allowed the Muslims to take over. And so they would be attacking the kingdom a couple kingdoms away, and then the clo a little closer and a little closer, and then they finally would be attacking you, but nobody would be helping you because they're a couple kingdoms away. The Crusades caused the Europeans to see the bigger picture. Sort of like the 13 colonies in America did not get along but when they had to fight the king of England, they said, hey, this is a bigger picture of the United States. We need to work together. Well, the Crusades caused the Europeans to have this concept of Europe, this concept of Christendom, this bigger picture. Anyway, so in 1300, the Muslims controlled Spain, North Africa, the Zanzibar coast of Madagascar, over to Indonesia, Northern Indian Mughals, and then all of Central Asia and into Eastern Europe. Now, T Tamerlane is the one that conquered Central Asia. Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkestan, they used to have a Christian presence there until Tamerlane. He's called the Sword of Islam. Conquers all that Eugeria, kills 17 million people, leaves pyramids of skulls, tells his men to come back with a skull in every hand. And his descendant was Baber, who was the founder of the Mughal Northern Indian Muslim Empire. You know them because of Shah Jahan. He built the Taj Mahal as a tomb for one of his wives. And it was such a beautiful building, he did not want another one that could rival its beauty. So he chopped off the hands of the workers, right? And the uh, Shah Jahan just wanted to exterminate the Sikhs. You ever see the Sikhs? They have like the towel on their head and sometimes mis people mistake them for Muslims that are not Muslims. The Muslim Shah Jahan tried to exterminate them, would just go into their villages and just kill them, millions of them. Then they invade into Eastern Europe and... Uh... Anyway, sorry for... Sharing all this gory stuff. I hope I'm not. Uh, just wanted to come and give you a little encouragement tonight, you know. And anyway, so they're going into Eastern Europe, and the Moldovans and Wallachians and Bulgarians, and they're all fighting off this Muslim horde while the rest of Europe is um, uh, having their art, literature, and music. You know, so I was uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, being driven back to the airport, and there's a, the driver's name was Igor. I said, well, that's an unusual name. Where are you from, Igor? He goes, oh, Moldova. I go, oh, I know something about Moldova. You had a King Stephen, and he fought the Muslims and kept them out. And he goes, yes, you know about Stefan Chalmari, which is Stephen the Great. He pulls out his little dollar bill, and there's a picture of Stefan Chalmari. So when the Moldova got free from the Soviet Union around 1980, they put it, printed their currency. They put a picture of their king that stopped the Muslims on their currency there. And um, so anyway, so these Eastern Europeans are fighting very courageously, and um, they started the Order of St. George of the Dragon Slayer. And the dragon was the sultan. And the, the vow was that you would show up on the day of battle because the Muslims would try to bribe different kings to not show up. And so the Romanian king joined. His name was Vlad, Vlad III. And the Romanian pronunciation of dragon was Dracula. And the Muslims were demanding boys. So they'd conquer a Christian area. They would demand boys for their pederasty, their, their homosexual culture, and they won't get into it all. And, uh, and so Vlad said, no more boys. And the Muslims were invading. He captured and impaled 20,000 of them. And so you got this army of 100,000 Muslims coming into Romania, and they go through the forest of the impaled, and they lose heart and turn back. And so Vlad's idea was to out-terrorize the terrorists. <laughs> and it worked, and he's actually a hero in Romania. I was speaking at a Romanian church down in Papano Beach, Florida, and the pastor was interpreting what I was saying into Romanian. And I get to the story, he goes, oh, Vlad, he saved our boys. And, you know, and so they all, this is, he's a hero. Anyway, but he did not drink blood. That was something a fiction writer made up. Uh, so by 1450, the Ottoman Empire has crossed the Bosporus where the Black Sea empties into the Mediterranean. This purple is what's left of the Byzantine Empire. What are these green and brown and yellow? Those are Venetian and Genoan merchant territories who are selling military goods to the Muslims for a buck. No one the Muslims are going to turn around and attack the Christians. So you have financial interests in the West betraying the West to Islam for money. No. And... Um, Anyway, so finally, Sultan Mamet sends over his navy, sends over his army. What's that thing? It's a cannon. They took the church bells from the Greek churches, melted it into the largest cannon in the world. It could shoot a 1,200-pound stone cannonball over a mile. They drug it to the, So they still want the largest cannon, but instead of gunpowder, it's nuclear power. And so Sultan Mamet conquers Constantinople in 1453. Now, why is that significant? Well, a couple of reasons. They've turned the largest Christian church in the world into a mosque, Hagia Sophia. 
165 feet high, 102 foot across dome, four acres of gold mosaics that cover with whitewash and crayon verses. This is the equivalent of turning the Vatican into a mosque. But it cut off the trade routes. First century, Romans and Han Empire traded. And there's even Roman records and Chinese records of sending ambassadors back and forth. 1271, Marco Polo. Remember the game, the kids play around the pool? Marco Polo. Marco Polo went from Venice, Italy to China in 1271. Worked for Kublai Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan. Brought back to Europe spaghetti noodles, coal, gunpowder. Talked about the Chinese inventing the pinata, the Pony Express, the wheelbarrow, the compass, and the Chinese invented paper from tree pulp rather than from papyrus reeds. And you know what they printed with the paper? The very first paper currency. You have paper currency in your wallet? That was invented in China during the Wan Dynasty. That's why they called their currency the Wan. So China was technologically superior to Europe. They had thread from worms, silkworms. They had plates made out of China. India had teas, dyes, and spices, so the Europeans wanted to trade. But when the Muslims conquered Central Asia, it cut off the trade routes, and that's when Columbus looked for a sea route. Christopher Columbus thought he made it to India, so he names the people he meets the Indians. Think of it. We never would have called Native Americans Indians if it had not been for Islamic Jihad and the Islamic State cutting off the land routes to India. Why did we call them Indians? Well, Columbus gave them the name because he thought he was in India. Why was Columbus trying to go to India? Because 40 years earlier, the Muslims cut off the land routes to India. And as the Muslims were invading into Greece, they were destroying the churches and the graves and the museums and the artwork. And so the Greek scholars were fleeing to Florence, Italy, bringing it all there, and we call this the Renaissance. In the late 1400s, this flood of Greek stuff into Florence, and the Greek scholars fled also with their Greek New Testaments. So here's Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a French philosopher. He says, the collapse of the throne of Constantine carried into Italy the debris of ancient Greece. Talks about the Muslim. And, and so the Greek scholars flee to Western Europe with their Greek New Testaments. And so that's when Erasmus translates the Bible from Latin all the way back to Greek. This leads, leads to something called the Reformation. Martin Luther starts the Reformation in 1517. In 1529, 100,000 Muslims surround Vienna under Suleiman the Magnificent. And um, they all pray, and it gets freezing cold for a week, and the Sultan gives up his fight. Martin Luther says, The Turk is the rod of the wrath of the Lord our God. If the Turk's God, the devil is not beaten first. There is reason to fear the Turk will not be so easy to beat. The fight against the Turks must begin with repentance. We must reform our lives or we shall fight in vain. Our sins and ingratitude have earned God's wrath and disfavor, so he justly gives us into the hands of the devil and the Turk. I apologize, my voice is a little bit raspy here. John Calvin writes, I hear the sad condition of your Germany. The Turk again prepares to wage war with a larger force who will stand up to oppose his marching throughout the land at his mere will and pleasure. John Wesley, ever since the religion of Islam appeared in the world, the spousers of it has been as wolves and tigers to all other nations, running and tearing all that fell into their merciless paws. Two centuries before the Reformation, Thomas Aquinas wrote, Muhammad seduced the people by promises of carnal pleasure. Those who believed in him were brutal men, desert wanderers. Muhammad forced others to become his followers by the violence of his arms. Sultan Suleiman controlled this enormous area of Morocco, Algiers, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Middle East, into Persia, and Eastern Europe, Turkey. And um, his counterpart was the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V of Spain, who controlled Spain, Spanish, Netherlands, Austria, Italy, a new world, and his Philippines are named after his son, King Philip of Spain, and then he controlled the Portuguese areas through marriage, and uh, the two most powerful kings in the world. So Charles V is faced with a double dilemma. He was Catholic. He was using the gold from the new world to stop the Muslims on the Mediterranean from taking over Europe. And he had the Reformation on one hand and the Muslim invasion on the other hand, so he decides to strike a deal with the Protestants called the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. It's the first treaty ever to recognize Protestants. Had this little Latin phrase, Cuius regio ius religio, which means whose is the reign, his is the religion. In other words, look, Protestant king, believe whatever you want in your kingdom. Let's just work together against these Muslim invaders because they want to kill us all. And it, it worked, but then the next centuries, the different countries of Europe decided to believe different things. Anyway, uh, Dragut Ries was the Muslim pirate admiral. Andrea Doria is the best the Italians could do to put up a fight. 16, 1565, 40,000 Muslims surround the little island of Malta. There's only 1,000 defenders, and they defeat the Muslims courageously on September 11th, 1565. And uh, 1683, 200,000 Muslims surround Vienna, Austria, and they're defeated on September 11th, 1683, by Jan Sobieski. Um, uh, he uh, had the largest cavalry charge in history up to that date, 40,000 big Polish Hussar horses, 
The soldiers had made wings for their back, made this enormous noise when they charged, and the Muslims dropped their weapons and fled. And um, when Jan Sobieski went into the abandoned Muslim tents, he finds these bags of beans, coffee beans. This was this new Muslim drink that allowed him to fight day and night. And shortly thereafter, this Polish general, George Franz Kleszowski, opens the first Vienna coffee house. Now, they weren't sure if they should drink coffee because it was the Muslim's drink. So they took a cup of it to Pope Clement. He tasted it, said, this is too good to leave for the Muslims. Let's baptize it. And then coffee spread across Europe. <laughs> now, the word coffee comes from the Arabic word kafir or kafir, which means infidel. Because the beans came from Ethiopia, which, one, which was one, <coughs> excuse me, one of the few African countries to stay Christian. So the Muslims call the Christians in Ethiopia coffers or infidels. And since the bean came from there, they called it the coffer bean or the coffee bean. So have you had your cup of infidel today? But, but it's okay to drink. Pope Clement said so. Now, the bakers in Vienna were up early cooking bread, and they heard noise under the ground. And they tell the soldiers who find that the Muslims were tunneling under the wall and setting explosives. They put out buckets of water so they could see the ripples, so they could see where the tunneling was. And so they intercepted the tunnel. They got in there just as the Muslims had sealed it off and lit the fuse. And they were able to defuse it just in time. And it saved Vienna. After the victory, they were going to reward the baker for warning them. The baker said, I don't need a reward. Just give me the sole permission to cook a pastry in the shape of the Muslim crescent. And it was called a croissant, the crescent roll. So the next time you have coffee and croissants, you can celebrate the victory of the Battle of Vienna, September 11, 1683. Well, there's lots of more stories. In 1697, 100,000 Muslims invade Serbia and Hungary, and they're defeated at the Battle of Zenta. And uh, Captain John Smith spent five years fighting the Muslims in Hungary before he founded Jamestown, Virginia. Uh, one of the pilgrim ships was captured by the Muslims, taken to Morocco, sold into slavery. Napoleon invades Egypt, and he um, was going to introduce liberty, equality. There were no words in the Arabic language for it. And after two years, he finally gave up and went back. And so these European countries were paying annual tribute to the Muslim pirates. And instead of going through the Catholic order, they would pay. And so the Spain, England, France. But when America broke from Britain, we were no longer covered by the British tribute payment. And so they began to capture our American ships called the Barbary Pirate War. And um, Thomas Jefferson... Uh, gets to be the president, and he sends in our Marines. We were paying 20% of our federal budget to the Muslim pirates. And so finally we defeat him. Um, and uh, anyway, Stephen Decatur says, the Algerians were believed to be masters of duplicity, willing to make agreements and break them when they found convenient. Well, Francis Scott Key. So this is the first war after the revolution, and the Americans are victorious over the Muslim Barbary pirates. And so they uh, come back to America, and there's such enthusiasm around America that Francis Scott Key writes a song nine years before he writes the Star Spangled Banner to the same tune that he writes the Star Spangled Banner to. It's called When the Warrior Returns from Battle Afar. In conflict resistless, each toil they endured till their foe shrunk dismayed from the war's desolation and pale beamed the crescent, its splendor obscured by the light of the star-spangled flag of our nation, where each flaming star gleamed a meteor war and the turbaned head bowed to the terrible glare that mixed with the olive, the laurel shall wave and form a bright wreath for the brow of the brave. Well, there's a whole, whole lot more, but it's all in the, the books and the DVDs, so you um, don't have to... Uh, listen to my raspy voice uh, longer. But um, in the books, I go through the third uh, er spring, the Arab Spring that started in 1928, and bring it all the way up to the present. But I mentioned this morning, uh, you know, someday you're going to be dead. It's a nice way to end the talk, you know. And, but you're going to be in heaven because you believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing his praise than when we just begun, imagine you've been in heaven 10,000 years. Maybe you get a chance to meet Moses. That would be pretty neat, walking the streets of gold. There's Moses. Maybe Moses will invite you over to his place. You know, Jesus said, my father's house are many mansions. I don't know what it's like up there, but I meant Moses would probably have a pretty nice place. Moses will, Moses will probably have one of those big fireplaces where the logs don't burn out. Get it? The burning bush in the wilderness didn't burn up, and the logs in his fire. Okay. <laughs> I heard one preacher say, in heaven, you'll be able to travel as fast as you think, and I'll probably show up late. <laughs> My wife said, where were you? I said, I was thinking about something else. I don't know. But imagine being there in Moses' living room, maybe like tonight, and maybe he's sitting right in front of you. And after the small talk's over, you tap him on the shoulder, say, Moses, 
tell us the story again. What was it like? He'll stand up, the room will get quiet, and goes, I was 80 years old. And Pharaoh, the most powerful military leader in the world, was charging at us. We were totally unarmed. I held out my staff and I said, God, use me to deliver your people. And the waves came in and swallowed up Pharaoh's chariots. We're going to say, wow. Then we're going to see David. Say, David, David, tell us your story. David will stand up and he'll say, well, you know, I was just a teenager. And this thug, Goliath, was mocking our God and mocking our faith. And these grown-ups were too chicken to do anything about it. And I said, well, I don't know everything they know, but I know how to use my little sling. And I went out and hit him in the head and took his own sword and chopped his head off. And we're saying, wow. And then Gideon's going to tell his story. 100,000 Midianites, and I got 30,000 Israelites. And God said, tell everyone that's scared to go home. Okay, now I'm down to 10,000. Still too many. Go drink from a creek. Gets it down to 300. And then he defeats the, the and then Deborah and all the great saints of old. And then everyone in the room is going to look at you. Said, you, we haven't heard your story yet. What did you do when it was your turn to be on earth? What were they saying about God in your country? Or the baby that the Lord knew in the mother's womb or marriage that God himself instituted in Genesis. The man shall leave the father and mother, cleave to the wife, and the two shall become. What did you say when, the, when there was a plan to reach out and touch the community for Jesus and, or reach Latin America with filter? You know, what did you do? I'd hate for any of us to be up there and Jesus to come in and have a big screen and all kinds of great things happen. And he says, you know, this is what you could have done if you would have been just a little more sold out to me. And realize you can't go back to earth because you're already in heaven because you believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. But guess what? We're still on this earth. We still have breath in our lungs. We still have feet to trod the soil. You still can do those things that you will be known for forever. This is your greatest hour. God loves to wait until things look hopeless and then he raises up little nobodies with faith and courage to do big things. And so it's sort of like a basketball game and he's the coach and you're on the bench and he goes, okay, it's your turn to get in, slaps you on the back. And you go, but, but, but coach, they're, they're bumping into each other out there. Coach, they're, they're sort of playing mean. He goes, yeah, yeah, it's your turn. I get in the game. He goes, but, but coach. And he goes, no, I made you. I trained you. I drafted you. I, I got everything. Now it's your turn. He says, look, you're six foot six and they're four feet tall. Now get in the game. <laughs> Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. God in his infinite wisdom knows exactly what's going on in the world today. And he saw that you were going to be born and alive right now. And he's given you his word. He's given you his spirit. He's given you an absolutely tremendous church family. You've got it. You've got what it takes. Now just go out there and be bold and do those great things that you will be known for forever. God bless you. Thank you.